So by the time I joined the cast, it was full into the full like Genshin Genshin swing, like Genshin fever all over the world. And so I kind of knew what I was stepping into, but also I really didn't even a little bit like at all. <laughs> Hey everyone, it's Sevi and welcome back to the Sevi Talks podcast where we have an exciting guest today, Jenny Yokobori. Hello, Jenny. Hello, my name is Jenny Yokobori and I'm wearing a pimple patch. Genshin listeners, you know Jenny as the Yoimiya voice actor English dub version and she's also recently joined the Honkai Star Rail cast. And she I don't have a visual aid for that character. <laughs> Soon, soon though. Soon. <laughs> Outside of that, she has done so many projects, whether voiceover, whether casting, directing, working on like all fronts of these projects. And we're going to touch on those a little bit. Jenny, there are so many things that you have done in your so far pretty young life, <laughs> which is amazing. <laughs> I'll get older eventually. <laughs> Something maybe Genshin players don't know that much about is that you are currently the youngest Simpsons cast member. I am. That's true. Hi. How did that go? How did that happen? <laughs> that's a great question. I ask myself <laughs> that same question every single day when I wake up. I just kind of wake up and I'm like, how the hell did I get here? <laughs> um, well, let's see. I auditioned in 2020. So it was during the pandemic, obviously, because it was in 2020. People always ask me, they're like, oh, how'd you get the job? And it's not really that exciting of an answer because it's like, I, I auditioned for it. It's like, I interviewed for the job and then I got the job. But it is kind of interesting how, like, what my audition process was like, because it was uh, after I had gotten furloughed, I was working at Disneyland at the time. And then the pandemic happened and Disneyland shut down. And so we all got furloughed. And so I didn't have a full time job. So I had to move back home with my mom in Nevada. And so I auditioned for The Simpsons when I was living with my mom in Nevada. And I used her walk-in closet that I had repurposed <laughs> into a booth, but was still very much still her walk-in closet. Whoa. And we had to like bargain time. And she was like, when are you going to be using my closet for, to record? I'm like, between these hours and these hours. And she's like, you have to be done before 9 p.m. because that's when I want to go to bed. I'm like, okay, great. And so I used my mom's walk-in closet to audition for The Simpsons. And that's how I booked The Simpsons. So that's kind of interesting. Um, I read for it. Um, I almost didn't read for it, actually, because I was so intimidated um, because I at that point I didn't really have any big credits to my name that people really knew about I had recorded a few things but hadn't gotten to announce them and so I was like I'm literally a nobody recording an audition in my mom's closet in Nevada and this is the Simpsons uh, and yeah. like, they didn't use a code name or anything they were just very forthright they were like hey you're reading for the freaking Simpsons and I'm like oh no oh. I'm 23 how the hell am I supposed to do this um I almost didn't read for it and then like 10 minutes before it was due I was thinking to myself I'm like my agent's gonna kill me if I don't read for this and so I just recorded like a really haphazard like put together audition being like okay I listened back to it I'm like okay it's fine whatever I'm like I'm not gonna book it but at least I won't get in trouble for not trying and then a week later I got notified by my agent that I booked it and I'm like I don't think so there's got to be a mistake <laughs> here that can't be that's correct that's such a funny reaction okay. <laughs> are you sure about that my actual reaction at the time I believe was that um I kind of froze in place because I was re recording auditions in my mom's closet and I got an email from my agent at like eight at night which is really unusual and it was just like Simpsons booking and I just kind of like sat there like this for Ooh. like a really long time just kind of like processing it I needed like one of those like shock trauma blankets that they wrap you up in, in like an ambulance and then I think I stood up and just like ran around my mom's house screaming and she was like on the like balcony like talking to a friend and I ran outside and I was like ah, yeah, 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 I thought someone legitimately legitimately had died oh my God. <laughs> and so she hung up her phone call with her friend and she looked at me really concerned and she was like what's happening and I'm like I booked the Simpsons and she's like oh that's nice <laughs> thanks mom <laughs> <laughs> I'm like mom you don't understand it's a really big deal and she's like oh okay <laughs> okay <laughs> <laughs> I love that. Auditioned from your mom's walk-in closet. From my mom's walk-in closet, yeah. And booked it. Okay, mm -hmm. that is so cool. 
I do see um, how VAs have their home studios in like closets or tiny booths and homemade stuff. So how has your homemade setup been like from your mom's closet or from wherever (laughs) you're living now? Uh, I am no longer living with my mother. I am now back in Los Angeles after the pandemic. But my mom's walk-in closet served me very well. I recorded a lot of auditions. I booked a lot of jobs with my mom's walk-in closet. I recorded uh, some like really big <laughs> projects from my mom's walk-in closet. And like my mom, like after I moved back, every once in a while, she would see me announce a role on Twitter. And she would call me and she would be like, did you record that one in my closet? And I would be like... <laughs> Yeah, and she's like, my closet's famous. And I'm like, okay. <laughs> Your mom is so funny. My mom, okay. My mom is like Glinda the Good Witch from The Wizard of Oz. Like, not I sassy Glinda from Wicked, but like, from like, OG Wizard of Oz, Judy Garland. She's just like, oh, how nice. <laughs> I booked Genshin during the pandemic. And so, Yoi Mia, oh. like some of your slides is from my mom's walking closet. Are from your... Wow. And she was very excited about that. Okay, Genshin listeners, time to thank Jenny's mom's walk-in closet. <laughs> Hashtag stand Jenny's mom's closet. Hashtag for this episode, stand Jenny's an mom's under, closet. An underrated MVP of the voice Actually. World. <laughs> so that's the VO stuff. And we'll talk about that a bit more. But before we jump into that, I also want to ask like your experience with directing and working the other roles of a project like i remember the last time we talked you were telling me that you had a project where you were basically doing like so much of it well i'm not done that project anymore because that project was not great for my mental health and i was not doing well so i stepped away um but now i'm doing a different project uh called all night arcade where i'm doing a good a good chunk of work as well. I'm doing directing and casting and I'm also voicing uh, some of the characters. And that's really exciting. I believe the episode, the first episode is going to be dropping on TikTok pretty soon. It'll probably be out by the time this episode is out. I don't know what your schedule is. It will be. It will like, be. Okay, cool. Yeah, yeah um, so go watch it now. Because go it's watch All Night Arcade. Yeah, it's at Ame Kicks, A M E Kicks on TikTok. Yeah, I'm doing that. Um, I've been doing some live action dub directing. Uh, I did a different, like, a different animated project that I directed that I can't really talk about. A couple of different okay. things here and there, some NDA things. But yeah, um, I love directing. I really love being able to, like, get my hands dirty with a project and really be involved on multiple levels with it. I have ADHD and when we people with ADHD love a thing, we don't love it in like a cool casual way. We love it in like Mm. a really like obsessive way. And so because like I have that trait within me, being able to be really hands on in a lot of different facets is really rewarding for me. Does it get hard managing the ADHD and also doing this project or how much does it help? (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> oh my gosh, yeah, no, ADHD, I think a lot of people who are neurodivergent can attest that it makes a lot of things very hard. Um, it does occasionally work as a superpower, like when I get into that kind of like hyper focus zone, where yeah. something really grabs my attention, or like I feel really like passionate about something like I can like jam out work really fast because of that. But for the most part, ADHD is a tricky thing to navigate when you have a lot of plates that you're spending at the same time. Directing by itself is already a lot of plates going, but adding on to that, oh my gosh. Compared to being on the voice acting end, going into the directing and casting end, do you work with like a lot more people? Does the does the sphere, the world get wider? I would say for directing and casting for sure. With a, as a casting director, I'm constantly looking for new people to put on my roster, new people to try out because someone gave me a shot back in the day, and so I want to give lots of people shots because you never know where you might find the next talent or like the next person you want to work with. Like there's so many people out there who are trying their best and are absolutely incredible that we just don't know about yet. So casting has helped me get to know a lot of people because. Yeah, I want to know more people. I want to give more people opportunities. Um, Directing as well, because then I'll be directing something. And when it's a project that I'm not the casting director on, someone will get brought on who I have no idea who they are. And I'll be like, hello, new friend. I'm here to tell you how to say your words good. (laughs) I'm very eloquent. And then acting, it's like, I'd say it with acting... Um, voice acting can be so isolating because we are all by ourselves most of the time. The kind of community comes in when I am... Can I cuss? (laughs) 
Oh, yeah, sure. Okay, when I'm shit posting on Twitter. <laughs> that's there usually where most of the voice acting community, like, that's always a big moment of mortification for me, where people will be like, oh, Jenny Okabori, no, I've heard of you. And I'll be like, from my work, right? And I'll, like, it's that Anakin meme where I'm like, from my work, right? And they're like, no, I follow you on Twitter. <laughs> I'm like, oh, no, I'm so sorry. Oh, no. you've seen me post pee pee poo poo so many times i'm so sorry this doesn't represent me completely a little bit but not completely <laughs> shit posting is actually for networking guys <laughs> there you go. use it to your advantage that's what they don't teach you in business school you gotta be good with memes yeah you you never know who's looking <laughs> looking at your dumb shit posts how much of it is remote work Ooh, I'd say honestly, it's probably like 50 50 because okay, uh, well, actually, lately, a lot more studios have been wanting us to uh, to bring us in in person. So I'd say mm. maybe like 70 30 these days. But there are still plenty of remote re recording sessions for sure. Even like as a director, you do you ask more people to come in these days? When I'm directing, I prefer to do it remotely, because uh, I have a sleep disorder. And so for live action dubs, uh, some of the studios want me to come in in person and I usually I'm like, please let me record remotely because a lot of the times the days start at 9 or 10 a.m. And my brain doesn't start at 9 or 10 a.m. as a person who has a sleep disorder. And so it can be kind of dicey driving for me. And so usually I'm like, please, please let me record remotely. And so I'm always very grateful when a project does let me do that. Like, yeah, the accommodations, those are very important. Yes, I really appreciate it. Like in the entertainment industry, I mean, how easy or how often do people move from like a starting acting role and then going to taking on the other roles like casting and directing? Definitely not super often, I don't think, because the majority of people I know don't do it. But, you know, mm -hmm. like one in 10 or so, maybe okay. just because... Uh, acting, you know, as is being illustrated right now with this current SAG strike, isn't always the most lucrative job unless you're like in the top 1% of actors. And so we have to have some kind of uh, side hustle or other like second job. And so luckily for uh, most of us who, you know, get lucky in that respect, uh, we get to do it within the same world. And so we get to also do casting or we also get to do directing or we also get to do writing. And so, okay. yeah. Mm hmm it comes right. from a place of uh, love and passion, but also often necessity is like for financial support. Yeah. Some people may also not understand like how not everyone in the entertainment industry is stinking rich. <laughs> <laughs> Very few of us are, in fact. Yeah. Uh, we'll, we'll return to the sag after stuff um, in a while. But how did that all start? How did you get into voiceover and voice acting and your Ooh. mom's walk-in closet? <laughs> Typically, I would just walk in there. Like, I would probably turn the doorknob a few times, but you know. Um, I got into voice acting. The first time I ever voice acted was during my very brief stint in college. I think I was in college for like two, three months, and then I, life happened. And I was like, goodbye, which I'm very wow. grateful for because now I don't know any student debts, which is very nice. I went to a school that is very well known for animation. And so the animation department always needed voice actors and so you would walk around the halls and uh you would see posters like voice actors wanted and I was there for acting and so I was like I've always wanted to try this because cartoons have been like a huge lifelong passion of mine let me let me give this a shot this looks awesome and fun and so I auditioned for one off of my phone I recorded in the voice memos app and then I sent it off and then like a little while later uh my now friend uh Wei Wu emailed me back was like, hey, I want you for the lead role in my uh, student film project. And so that was like my first experience doing that. And it was really awesome. And then um, one of my uh, best friends, Pam Hogaboom, who's also one of my favorite artists on top of being one of my best friends, an incredibly talented animator. She would have me do miscellaneous stuff for her films and her projects as well, which is always really fun. I was a little dumb, dumb. And so it didn't really fully process in my brain for a long time actually like probably like three years after I did uh, like some light voice acting here and there and then I'm like oh this is my favorite thing I've ever done you know going through different odd jobs and survival gigs for like three years and then being at one of those survival gigs which was being a tour guide at Universal Studios Hollywood and taking a uh, free tour guide class with Bob Berg in the voice of Porky Pig and like Whoa. learning about voice acting yeah that was a cool that was a cool one uh taking that free voice acting class which was like 
two, three hours long and being like, oh, so this is like a full job that people do. Like I kind of just assumed that you could only do it if you were a famous person Mm. and you would get, then you would get cast in like a Pixar film or something. Like it didn't occur to me really that it could be just like a person job, (laughs) you know, for, for the non-rich people. Which was ironic because I was already obsessed with voice actors. Like, I admired Grey Delisle and Tara Strong growing up. And I would always get excited when I'd see their name in the credits. I'm like, oh, there they are again. And then still, like, it just <laughs> didn't process in my dumb little brain that I'm like, other people do this job besides celebrities. <laughs> <Just> didn't process <laughs> yeah. for a long time. And then uh, I remember very clearly I was doing a shift at uh, one of my survival jobs, Disney. Uh, and I was sitting in the, like, the back of a van. <laughs> getting ready to work a grad night and all of a sudden it like hit me like a bolt of lightning like i swear it felt like divine intervention like it was just sort of like and i was like voice acting is my career voice acting is the thing i should be doing for the rest of my life oh my god and then i just started doing like as like i started picking up as many shifts as i could at disney so i could afford classes and workshops to do it yeah and so yeah i just went full force into that like it just occurred to me one day and i look back now and i'm like you idiot why did it take you that long? <laughs> you did the college stuff and then you you started a little bit there and then you said that you were there for a few months so <laughs> did you did you leave like once you started doing your survival jobs or once you started doing the vo like getting the classes and oh yeah the vo classes didn't start for another like three years actually Okay. That's why I call myself a little dummy because I'm like, I loved it so much, but it just didn't occur oh. to me that I could do it as a job. I was just sort of like, what a neat thing I got to do. Okay, <laughs> time to go do a job that I'm miserable at. Yeah, like I left college. Um, It was for personal reasons. It, my dad passed away. And so we couldn't afford it. A whole bunch of reasons there. But ultimately left college, went straight into the workforce. I started working like a million different jobs, which is at the time like, how I eventually got into pyro, pyrotechnics for a little while too, which was a job that I actually really liked. And I would do like other different acting odd jobs just to help make ends meet. Like I would go on backstage.com or LA casting and like non-union commercials or do weird little modeling things here and there, random student films. And it would make like 150 bucks a day. And like, it would just like sort of be supplemental income. And I wasn't really passionate about it, but I knew that like, it could help make me a little bit more money than my minimum wage job. That was another reason why I kind of eventually found myself to, in voice acting because I was doing more and more like modeling jobs and small time acting gigs. And I was like, I should be happy. I'm like, why aren't I happy? Like, why, why is this making me more miserable? And I kind of realized I'm like, oh, on camera acting doesn't really make me feel good. Uh, being on camera made me feel really, really nervous. And like, that was uh, what my tour guide job at Universal c- kind of helped me realize too. Because I realized I really, I really didn't like that job. And I couldn't figure out why. I'm like, if this is performing, like, I should be happy. And then I realized, I'm like, well, I really like giving tours when the camera's off. I'm like, oh, oh, I don't like being on camera that much. That's sort of been something that I, like, I didn't realize until that moment that I'm still trying to work through. Because now I'm doing my YouTube thing. And so I'm like, okay, let's work past this little roadblock. Well, when it comes to YouTube, that is going to be an interesting roadblock to work with. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, it sure but... is, Sevi. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, that is a process of self-discovery or like mm-hmm. self-discovering what you don't like, which is mm-hmm. at least one way to arrive at what you do like. Mm-hmm. Um I guess how did your how did your mom feel about it? Like obviously she's really happy that you were using her closet, and, you know. <laughs> um, but how does it? How does she see it now? Like does she get your in these amazing projects now? And how is oh she yeah, starting she, out? she 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 she's starting to get it. She I remember when I told her because it was that night when I was in sitting in the back of that Disneyland van. I called her like immediately afterwards, being like, "Hey mom, oh. I just figured out what I want to do for the rest of my life," and she was like, "That's nice." <laughs> and she was like doctor and I was like voice actor and she's like ah oh, shit I'm half Japanese half white she is she is the white parent and so she was definitely always the more like loosey-goosey of the two of them mm-hmm. but still very much I can imagine like you know her wanting to be on the other line and hearing like hey mom I think I want I found my dream job and was hoping it would be something like you know stable and Uh actually reliable Mm -hmm. and really like dependable and I was like voice actor and she's like ah god damn (laughs) and she's like can you make money doing that and I was like probably (laughs) 
but my mom's always been super supportive of me like my entire childhood and adolescence like she was very much the parent that was like yeah whatever you want to do follow your heart's desire you can do whatever you want to and like I think like she was always a really wonderful mom and the respect were to the point where I think I was like when I was a kid I probably said things like I want to be a dragon when I grew up and she's like that's great (laughs) my dad is very much the person that's like well dragon starts with dr and that stands for doctor so close enough no you should be a doctor (laughs) surgeon it's it's the Japanese the Japanese half exactly my mom was the white one and she was like follow your dreams my dad was like Mm -hmm. follow medical school (laughs) it's so interesting like having a parent that's supportive even though they don't truly under or don't completely understand what you're doing like it's interesting no <laughs> it's oh a my fun gosh. dynamic <laughs> all right so in the recent years i guess when genshin blew up and like you you were like part of the cast i did that feel like a drastic change or was it like yeah. a, you know what it's another project done done and dusted you know how how is that in contrast <laughs> it was definitely the former um so i joined the cast a little bit late because i was in inazuma uh and you know when the game came out it was uh i almost said fontaine that's not it um it was <laughs> monstat and monstat And so I joined the game a little bit later. Um, So by the time I joined the cast, it was full into the full like Genshin, Genshin swing, like Genshin fever all over the world. And so I kind of knew what I was stepping into, but also I really didn't even a little bit like at all. So I had had friends who were in the game. Kaylee was one of the starting cast members, like Stephanie Sutherland, Core, like a bunch of people. I was seeing how their lives were being affected by this game and it blowing up. I was like, I was a big fan of the game because I'm like, my friends are in this. Let me try playing it. And then I was like, oh no, I'm in love with this game. Oh no, (laughs) this is the worst case scenario. And so by the time that I got cast, yeah, I had a very vague idea. And then when I got to announce, I was like, oh, I actually had no idea. (laughs) Ah. Because I think when I announced uh, Yoimiya that I was her voice actor, I think my Twitter following went up like 10,000 people overnight. And it was crazy because my biggest role up until that point was when I got to announce my involvement in Fire Emblem Heroes. And I think that got me like 200 followers. And I was like, that's huge. Like, that's enormous. Like, I remember thinking like my phone was overheating from... um, like the notifications on Twitter when I announced Fire Emblem and I was not mentally prepared for the difference <laughs> that Genshin was going to be. I was like hanging out with my ex-boyfriend that night, like we were still dating at the time when I got to announce and it was like my phone wouldn't stop buzzing and I had to like turn off my phone <laughs> because oh it was my. it was just like crazy amount of notifications and my life changed basically overnight. Because I went from someone who was very much like under the radar, like kind of like, you know, working class voice actor doing additional voices here and there. Like I had already announced The Simpsons, ironically, I think, but people Mm -hmm. still like very much like, okay, like Jenny Okabori, she's like, you know, she's new, she's working. That's good. To all of a sudden having a lot of eyes on me and it was startling. (laughs) Yeah. Having like so many people follow you and then suddenly like know who you are and get like launched into that space actually how was the prog process sorry i auditioned for genshin a lot of times okay like a, like oh my god it felt like hundreds of times like that's definitely hyperbolic but it felt like so many times and every single time i would see the new characters get announced it was like soul crushing because mm-hmm. i was like i'm like oh, man i really thought i nailed the, those auditions this time like damn it like what am i missing like what's what am i doing wrong And it would be motivating because I'd want to get better. But at the same time, it would be like so disappointing. And this, of course, is one of the hardest parts about voice acting is the rejection. But when uh, Yoimiya came around, it was funny because like they were using a codename for her. They were using a codename for the game. I had a funny feeling it was for Genshin because like like uh, like because some of the lines were kind of giveaways yeah does like does anyone fall for the code name (laughs) sometimes yeah sometimes they get you and you're like what am i recording for and they're like oh you're recording for this and you're like okay so i had a funny feeling it's it was for genshin and i was looking at these characters and they were like super cute and i was like oh man i like just i was so desperate to be in the game at that point because i loved it so much as a fan and i 
just wanted to be a part of the story and be a part of the world. Um, so I auditioned, I sent it in, and Joy Mia was ironically the one, again, it was like the Simpsons, like that I spent the least amount of time on, where it was like, I saw her and I'm like, okay, I think I get her. And I just like did, I think maybe one or two takes and just sent it off as opposed to like the other characters in that batch that I auditioned for. Like I did several takes and I was like really like nitpicking and like doing the acting school thing where I was like analyzing the script. But for you, I mean, I was just sort of like, okay, yeah, just gonna send that off. <laughs> Looking back now, it makes a lot of sense why I got her as opposed to the other ones. Because I'm like, oh, if I immediately understand her, just like at an instinctive level, of course, it's going to be the one that I'm bu- going to book as opposed to the ones that I have to do a lot of deep character work for, where I have to like try and put myself in that headspace. So um, it was very natural. It was really natural. Yeah, exactly. It just came completely naturally for me, for you, I Mia. And then I got the word that I booked it and I was sitting in my car, you know, in Nevada I would drive and get Mexican food for lunch. So I was sitting in a parking lot and I opened up my email, checked my email, saw that I booked Genshin and started crying in my car surrounded by like tamales. Or no, it was enchiladas. It was enchiladas. It's a very vivid It's very memory. important. Very important distinction. They told me that I booked a character called named Yuimiya and they use code names for all the characters. And so I'm like, which one is that? So at that point, like you weren't totally sure. No, I had no idea. It's because like I auditioned for... There was uh, four different female characters yeah. in that batch of auditions. Um, okay, so it just had to be one of them. <laughs> it was one of them, and I was like, which one is it? They had the code names. Did they have the image of the character? You said they all looked really cute. Yes, that we had images of the characters at the ah, time. Yeah, okay. it was like very under like lock and key. So they were like, "Do not share okay. this." And I was like, "I would, no, I would sooner die." So like when you finally got to go in and like do read the lines, like did that naturalness. And, un- and like fundamental understanding of the character, did it hold all throughout? It did. I started out, I definitely was nervous going into my first session. And so it took like a second for me to like get comfortable. But the second I did, it was just sort of like slipping on like a pair of well-worn sneakers. It was just really natural. There's a reason people love Yoimiya so much. And like a big part of it, for those who play the English dub, a big part of it is her voice acting. And oh, like, God. I agree. <laughs> I mean, like myself included, um, when Inazuma came out, you know, and then like Ayaka and Yoimiya came out, you know, of course everyone was like, Ayaka, you know, she's from the beta. She's like mm-hmm. princess, waifu very much. But I was like, oh man, there's just something about Yoimiya. <laughs> I love her. That that always means a lot to me. It's like whenever anyone tells me that they that they like my work in Genshin, it really it it makes my heart glow. It makes me really happy. Okay, that skyrocketing like your Twitter presence. <laughs> did that translate to professional opportunities? So something that has always been a huge goal of mine, and it still is, is to book a lead in an anime series. And up until when I booked Yoimiya, I wasn't even really getting the chance to read on anime. After Yoimiya got announced and everything, that's when people were like, hey, this girl exists. Let's give her some opportunities here and there. And so that's when like I started getting a few more opportunities uh, in anime. So I'm still working towards more because it's okay. still kind of rare that I uh, read an anime because people saw me as like, oh, they saw like I did The Simpsons and they saw that I did like Hello Kitty. And so they're like, oh, she's a prelay girl. She likes prelay animation. And I'm like, no, 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 I do the other one too. I do the other one too, I promise. <laughs> Please. Oh, wait. So type ca- is that like typecasting in a way? In a way, yeah. Like people didn't see me as someone who did anime. And I'm like, no, I do. I really want to. I mean, Genshin is like practically, oh, I'm sure it's a different discipline, but a lot of people see it as an anime video game already. So, mm-hmm. and we, I mean, we're literally getting an anime now, too. Yeah, exactly. All right. Um, crossing my fingers for that one. Becoming part of the Genshin cast. You said you already had friends who mm-hmm. were already in roles in Genshin. Yeah. What was it like being part of that group? Because I see you guys like, have hangouts like you meet each other Mm -hmm. over streams or virtual calls yeah we're very we're very tight-knit cast i kind of find that interesting because Mm -hmm. i don't know like when i see voice actors of like a show for example or like a movie i guess because it's a hollywood movie maybe the celebrity actors there like it's just another role for them or maybe they don't get so tight-knit but what is it like i guess being in that community and the cast yeah not every cast is like this for sure like i'm a part of 
couple different projects where it's like, yeah, the cast doesn't really talk to each other. Like we're all friends, but we don't bond over that same to that same degree. I think what sets Genshin apart was like how freaking big it got and how really none of us were used to having that kind of attention on us. And so a lot of us were very scared. And so we banded together out of necessity. <laughs> At least that's that's my viewpoint where it's like, oh, we should all try and figure out how to navigate this together as opposed to trying to shoot, like taking shots in the dark. How many of them had you already, had you not yet met and then met eventually for the first time? Probably a majority of them actually. So I was still pretty green, still pretty new in the industry. And so Genshin really introduced me to a lot of my friends. Like I hadn't met Erica Harlicker, I hadn't met Sarah Miller Cruz, I hadn't met Zach. Wow. So I'm very, very grateful for Genshin for expanding my group of friends. Usually you guys are pretty associated with each other, like at this point of Oh yeah. You know <laughs> at this point oh, of the yeah. game and the player base. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Like when you know, when the VAs hold like their whether individual or group or collab streams mm-hmm. or even appear in each other's blogs or posts, like it's always such a fun thing. And I guess it's interest. It's super interesting seeing a cast that is as tight knit because, like as you said, I, it's not that typical, or maybe it's it's not mm-hmm. the norm. I have a question about like going to conventions. Sure, Did you start doing a lot more when Genshin came out. I was not doing any conventions before Yoimiya was announced. Wow. <laughs> so what was it like starting starting con- doing conventions? It was scary as hell. <laughs> I didn't know if people would give a shit about who I was. I was so scared of like, it felt very similar to holding like a birthday party and I didn't know if anyone would come. Like doing my first convention, uh, my first one was Anime Impulse um, and they had me do a table and I was so scared. Like I remember I was talking to my ex the night before uh, and I was like, what if no one cares who I am? Like what if no one comes? Like what if no one wants my autograph? And so I actually brought my Nintendo Switch with me. Because okay. I didn't know if anyone would come hang out with me. And so I brought my Switch so I would have something to do. I was so, so relieved when people actually came up to me. They're like, hi, I know who you are. And I, honestly, and I have to look up from your Switch. <laughs> exactly. I was playing Animal Crossing. I didn't have big lines. It was at most at my table at one given time. It was probably like two people max. Mm-hmm. And so I was, honestly, that was really fun for me because I could really take time and spend like quality time with the people who came up to me. So I'd be like, do you want to see my island? And they're like, yeah, okay. That's a perfect icebreaker (laughs) game to bring, actually. (laughs) I think the people who uh, often get taken aback the most are the Sanrio fans. uh, Because the Sanrio fans are really, really sweet people, but a lot of them are very soft-spoken and that they have Sanrio as a, like, very, it's a comfort to them. So it helps bring them out of their shell and helps them, like, foster a sense of community and then especially it's true for like the younger Sanrio fans. Like I'll have a lot of like 10 to 12 year olds come up to me and they're so shy and they're so <laughs> sweet. And they're like with their parent and they're like, they're, or parents and they're like holding on to their like pant leg and like hiding behind their like mom That's or dad. So cute. And their parents usually like, sorry, they're really shy. And like, I'll be like, hi, it's nice to meet you. And they're like, oh God. Usually like I, when I can tell them like, oh, I'm coming on, on strong and they're really scared and they but they still want to talk to me. That's when I usually like ask the kids to like close their eyes. And I'm like, I'm like, do you like Kuromi or Cinema Roll better? And they're like, I like Cinema Roll. And I, and I talk to them in Cinema Roll's voice and their eyes get all like big. It's always really cute. Cause like I just tell them to close their eyes and then they do. And then second I start being like, hi, it's really nice to see you. My name's Cinema Roll. Like their eyes like shoot open and they're like, <gasps> and so yeah, whenever usually the nervous fans come from Sanrio and they're usually kids and I usually do that and that makes them feel a little bit more comfortable a little bit more at ease. I have no delusions of grandeur. I'm like, I know that they're not talking to me because they care about Jenny Okabori, Aquarius. They want to talk to me because I'm Cinemaroll or because I'm Kuromi and so I'm like, let them talk to like Cinemaroll or Kuromi and that's what they came here for. How is that dynamic when it comes to the Yoimiya fans? The people who kin Yoimiya are bubbly, vivacious, extroverted, (laughs) really like excited to meet me and they're all like really really sweet they're really passionate people i love your uh, i love your tiktoks as well when you kind of <laughs> just like tap them on the shoulder and you're like you like yoimiya <laughs> i'm her how is that like actually doing it in person like we see the tiktok of it <laughs> oh no it's really scary because um i 
have uh, RSD, which is rejection sensitive dysphoria. And so the reason I do those TikToks was because it was sort of similar to uh, me doing the Sanrio voices for little kids. It's because like I want to be able to create a cool experience for the fans because I grew up very much like a hardcore fan girl of a lot of things. And so that I always kind of like put myself in the, the shoes of like my teenage self and be like, Hey, if I was a fan of this, like what kind of experience would I want? And so I kind of mm. do that and foster experiences for fans based on that. Like those TikToks were born from me being at a convention and not a lot of people were coming up to me. And I was kind of like, and it was like, I was seeing a lot of Genshin cosplayers too. And I was like, I don't think they have any idea who I am. Cause like they would walk right past me and I'm like, huh, they have no idea. Also it was coming from a place of me wanting to create a cool experience and also me being a little shit. And so yeah. <laughs> I was at a convention and I was like, what if I played a prank on them? What if I played a prank? And whenever I play pranks on people, I always try and make sure that nobody ever gets hurt. Because if if people get hurt, it doesn't feel like a prank. It just feels like me. Yeah. So I was like, let me try these pranks to see like if they like it. And then like the fans were responding really, really well. And like even people who I saw like walk past my table were like really surprised and excited and happy. And like they told me that it made their day. And I was like, oh, this is making people happy. Let me keep doing this. And then I was like, okay, let me post it on TikTok. Like, because I, I thought it was funny. And then apparently other people thought it was kind of funny too. Because <laughs> those went really crazy viral. I mean, that is viral stuff. It's a very candid reaction. It's a very mm -hmm. candid and visceral reaction. Like, oh my God. If I can be very like candid, I've made actually a, a bunch more of those TikToks, but I'm kind of scared to post them just because there was kind of like some not so nice people in the comments. And so I'm, a, yeah, I'm kind of a sensitive person. Yeah. And so I've been holding back on posting those just because like my feelings were a little bit hurt, but I do want to, I'll post them someday. I mean, the capturing those experiences and those pranks, they are like the good vibes, safe, but still super funny pranks, like better than 99% of the pranks that we I would see on the internet um, yeah. these days. I guess right now, I I would like to shift to like a little less chaotic topic. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, at this point, we are at another historical yeah. moment. Right? We just keep living through those, don't we? <laughs> Exactly. Like it's we getting kind of through... tiring living through these unprecedented times. It is. It is <laughs> exhausting. Yeah, there is a SAG after a strike going yeah. on. Jenny, I mean, I think you can explain it a little better than I can. The actors are on strike. Um, specifically, we are striking against the like network, theatrical, and streaming contracts. There's a bevy of issues at the heart of why we are striking. Um including but not limited to residuals, um, AI. The climate is so different than it was the last time we had a, these contracts negotiated. Streaming has taken like the industry on a completely different direction in a way that a lot of people didn't predict. Um, it's completely changed the way that people are able to make a living these days as an actor. Um, back, in, back in the good old days, people were able to, you know, book a recurring, recurring or a guest role like role on a TV show and it was guaranteed to play on network TV, which means you were guaranteed a certain amount of residuals and people were able to make a living that way. But these days, a lot of shows are going directly to streaming and aren't playing on network TV at all. Like they just skip that step altogether. And because of that, like we don't really get residuals anymore. And so people will be on some of your favorite TV shows like Lucifer or Orange is the New Black. You'll be like, oh yeah, they're probably really rich and well off because they're on like a ton of episodes. They were like part of the main cast. And most of the time they still have to keep like their bartending job <laughs> because mm. the money that we're making off of this, it's like for a season where you're like on seven different episodes or like you're on like work a week, it's like $7,000, which sounds like a lot of money until you realize like, oh, that's going to pay for like several months of rent and groceries and taking care of their kids and their vet bills and their medical bills. The old days, like you would be expecting more money to come in too. And so like you didn't have to hustle as hard because you're like, okay, like this is going to have residuals like come around and then that'll help me pay and like keep things like running until the next thing comes around and that's just not true anymore <laughs> that and also the fact that like the things that are going to streaming like there are some residuals but it's like twenty dollars for like oh, an entire God. season for like years of paying it's pennies compared to what it should be yeah and so people are struggling <laughs> not only that but then also shows that aren't doing well on streaming they're just being taken down 
so that way these companies are getting out of paying residuals even if they are really small amounts they're just not paying yeah. them at all or they're creating these shows and then they're never releasing them and just like deleting them deleting them essentially for tax purposes or like a show will get like picked up for three seasons and then it'll just be canceled out of nowhere That's not to crazy. mention all the craziness with the ai where it turns out like the amptp their one of their deals that they tried to strike with sag was that they wanted for as far as ai goes is that they would want to pay an extra for one day of work and then own their likeness in perpetuity Forever. and be able and be able to use them whenever they want and i'm like that's insane yeah <laughs> they wanted it essentially is. extras to sell their soul for like a couple hundred bucks it's, it's absolutely crazy to me because it's the same principle as if you went like if you were working at any other job like if you were a teacher and you went into work for one day and then they just were like okay that's all we need you for and you're like but i need to keep working i need to make keep making money and they're like no 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 we stole your teaching and then now we don't need to use you anymore so we don't need to pay you it's crazy that we've like gotten to this level where that's actually something that not even considering it's something that they're like trying to get oh, we're like, trying put to into like effect. implement yeah, like yeah. they were like 100% sold on the idea. They're like, oh yeah, SAG's going to go for this. And it's like, no, why would we? I imagine like in their warped perspective, they think that extras are, they're like, oh, well, you know, it's just extras. And I'm like, no, extras, like extra work is how like a lot of people like make ends meet because we're not constantly working big jobs or anything, especially not in camera yeah. actors. And so there are going to be days where like you just need to like make ends meet and make some money for the day. And so you go to like central casting and mm -hmm. you get put on for like extra work and then you're able to like pay for groceries that week. Like it's extra work is essential to it like is. the actor's economy. Yeah. And when I was when I was asking you a little earlier, like what projects were affected and things like that like you you said you know anything from the extras to Lupe to you even said like a gps yeah. voice which i was exactly surprised yeah. by you are watching a movie and you hear like turn left on the next exit then like that's an actor who got paid for a day of work and right now with the strike we can't even do that yeah because voiceover is affected under the theatrical and network and streaming contracts right now I, I don't know if like as a listener maybe you've heard about this issue and you're you're thinking like oh but i've heard about this since a few months ago a few months ago it started with the writers like it was the writers who started the strike and now it's just well as of recording it's going to be a little later when the episode comes out but uh a few days ago or about a week ago it has included the actors as well. How does this like affect you and and your life currently? It's still the very early days of the strike. And so we're still all kind of figuring out what we are and aren't allowed to do. But I'm, you know, like I'm very firm when it comes to my beliefs as far as union stuff goes. So I am not planning on crossing that picket line at all. So I'm not going to be working on like streaming shows that I'm not allowed to. Like there are going to be things that are allowed because um, SAG recently released like a little help helpful little infographic telling us the things that we are allowed to work on. Um, but yeah, like that's what I'm sticking to. And the projects that are mainly being affected are the ones that do go on Hollywood or streaming yeah. services. You said that video games currently aren't affected. No, video games, new media aren't really affected right now. And so when I was talking about uh, Ame Kicks, the All Night Arcade, that's not affected. Um, mm -hmm. Okay, so even so, if it's like a, an under SAG, since it's a video game, it's not That's affected. okay. Yeah, okay. that's okay. So okay. if Ghostwire Tokyo was coming out this week, I would be able to be like, yeah, I'm in Ghostwire Tokyo. I feel like the fear is kind of there now that eventually the new media or the new other stuff might head in that direction as well. And especially when it comes to AI, the way that AI is being misused on so many fronts. Abused, and, I would say, is the word I would Okay, use. abused, yeah. yeah. Let's go with that. Is mm -hmm. being abused on so many fronts, um, especially with so many creative projects. It gets ridiculous how far they're going to try to exploit it. I mean, exploit other people through exploiting AI. It just doesn't make sense to me because, like, I saw this really good tweet that was like, do we really want a future where like robots are writing poetry and doing the painting and we're all stuck doing the jobs that we don't want to do like that's the thing that i keep coming back to i'm like why are we trying to automate art like it's art yeah art and entertainment is an industry industry that people like aspire to be in and dream about being and like have genuine passion for so why are we trying to 
automate it. Like, it doesn't make any yeah. sense to me. Like, I understand, like, capitalism and, like, efficiency and things like that. But also, I think that's bullshit and stupid. So <laughs> It is. I agree. There's more to life than efficiency and profit exactly. margins. Exactly. Well, I'm relieved to know that despite that there are still like work opportunities like available yes. um especially with new media and video games and hopefully and those, dubbing yeah and dubbing and dubbing mm -hmm. and hopefully those stay as safe opportunities for a mm -hmm. while i would hope that people who are um participating in the entertainment industry and honestly whether you're a listener or a viewer or whatever like the entertainment industry is like on all of us it's everywhere yeah. you can't avoid it so hopefully they become aware of like what is going on also i think it's also the funniest thing to me is that there's a couple of people who are being like you know oh well screw the actors this doesn't affect me and i'm like what are you talking about oh my god yeah i'm like do you watch tv do you watch streaming <laughs> do you do anything like yeah it absolutely affects you and it's yeah. like the same people who are like well screw the artist ai like this doesn't affect me. I'm like, yes, it does. Art does affect you. Literally everything that you do has to do with art. What are you talking about? Maybe people like still have this perception that art is like the thing in museums or like a high art that people don't really yeah, I, access right now. But people that's still not think it. that working art, like this is a completely different subject than the SAG after strike, but people still think like working artists are like people sitting in like grassy fields like painting on an easel like they think like that's what artists are who are like selling selling their paintings to galleries i'm like no it's graphic designers it's website designers it's people who are like working in all kinds of facets like the greeting card that you got for your like wife that week like that's someone's art it's yeah. like the cartoons that your kids watch like that's someone's art like art affects everything in your life it's a gross misunderstanding of i guess what our world has become now in terms of the industry and and how that actually affects people whether mm -hmm. part of the industry or experiencing the industry as an outsider. Thank you for like explaining and going into that. And it was great hearing it from you, um, from a voice actor, especially, and someone in the industry, because like, even if I talked about it, like I wouldn't, you know, I wouldn't have like those experiences to draw from. You did mention the YouTube thing. Yeah. And <laughs> Yeah, the YouTube thing. And like, I do want to ask about that, like not to put any pressure on it or anything. What has got you interested in starting to go for the YouTube? I would say like the hefty majority of media that I consume, like when I have time off, I usually just I go to YouTube and I watch like content creators channels, things like that. I just have always really admired and connect with the authenticity of it, where it's not some big corporation like trying to crunch numbers to figure out what the audiences might like it's just someone who's like alone in their room who decided that they want to make videos and so it's their own passion that drives them and so i really respond well to that kind of content and it's always been something that i really enjoy and consume a lot of i decided to try my hand at it because um making those silly tiktoks last year it, despite the not so nice comments i did have a really great time with it and it was really fun for me uh years i've made friends who are content creators and i really really love them and i think they're amazing and i see what they do and like they inspire me like you like you inspire the crap out of me and so i see people doing it and i always kind of wondered i'm like is this something that i can do like it looks like fun i really like mm -hmm. the idea of being my own boss and not having to really like send ideas back to a committee and have them like yeah approved or vetoed like i can just do any old stupid little thing that comes to my head and that's really fun for me so i think that has like it, that was always been really appealing to me it's just the creative freedom of it and then just really getting to be like completely authentic and be myself i mean there is a lot of freedom in youtube mm -hmm. like and what you said actually about like wanting that authenticity and like genuinely be from people um i love that because it i mean that idea is something that a lot of people refer to as like the original youtube Mm -hmm. Like I kind of look at the different phases of YouTube or when people, whenever people talk about it, like they have video essays about mm -hmm. it. They're like YouTube intros dying or, you know, YouTube forms changing. And yeah. What is the industry? Um, whenever they talk about how it started and the YouTubers that grew and really made an impact and kind of made it where it was, it was always from that idea. Like they wanted mm -hmm. something that was genuine, that connects, that helps people feel less lonely or mm -hmm. at least is, you know, more personal and like connection. Yeah. 
all the YouTubers that I've always like really responded to and like been like become a fan of are the people who are just really passionate about something and want to share that passion with someone. I guess like how different is it making your own YouTube video compared to something that you do already from the top, like directing, for example? It's so different because that's sort of been a learning curve for me is that understanding that I can really do anything I want on YouTube because directing, I still have to like kind of like check in with the client and being like, hey, is this in line with like the brand or with like the mm. kind of message that you want to convey or the tone that you want to convey? Whereas with YouTube, I can just kind of do whatever I want. And that's kind of been exciting for me. Upload my first vlog. I'm doing like yeah. recorded some game footage of me playing Among Us and like Phasmophobia with my friends. Um, but I'm going to try a whole bunch of things just because I can. And that's really exciting yeah. for me. It's like, oh, I don't have to just stick to one thing. And like if something looks fun to me, I can just do it. Like I'll probably like do some trends and everything. But mostly it's like if it makes me laugh and smile and I think it'll make someone else laugh and smile then I kind of want to do it and that's really fun <laughs> my favorite thing in the world ever since I was a kid was making people laugh and so I think that's another big motivator of me getting into YouTube is that um I don't know I just like making people laugh and I like connecting yeah. with people on that level the craziest thing for me is that like I as I mentioned before like being on camera kind of makes me nervous and YouTube yes. has kind of like been I'm using it as kind of like a therapeutic way to get over that fear which is an insane thing to say because, you know, YouTube comments are just always so famously <laughs> kind. I was, about to, I was about to say that. It's like, it's very brave. It's, <laughs> it's a, a brave way to go about it. It's ex I'm trying to use that as like exposure therapy, I think. As I'm filming my YouTube videos, I'm kind of realizing that the thing that bothered me about being on camera wasn't the fact of just being on camera. It was about being on camera by someone else's terms. And I had to look a certain mm. way. And I had to present myself a certain way. And okay. with YouTube, it's completely on my terms. And so if I want to film a video or appear on a podcast with a pimple patch on my face, I can just do that. And I don't have to appear perfect or anything. Having like all that control, like whether from the creative process or even just how you appear, that must be a very therapeutic aspect <laughs> it is <laughs> yeah honest. i can't speak for everyone but my experience as um an asian female it's that i have felt the pressure to kind of cater um people's experience when it comes to me a little bit growing up where it's like i was expected to present a certain way i am expected to act a certain way i'm expected to be a certain way and weigh a certain amount and look a certain yeah like, perfect amount and it's, it's really kind of suffocating. And my 20s in general has kind of been me unlearning that kind of behavior and accepting me for who I am whenever I am at that mm -hmm. current moment in time. And that's kind of how I'm trying to take my approach to YouTube content too, where it's like, I'm not always going to be perfect. I'm not always going to be pretty and shiny and sparkly, but that's kind of how I want it to be. Like I want to present as Jenny and not as Jenny TM. Yeah. <laughs> Actually, using creation or like a creative process as, as a way to, I guess, process that and like go through your self-discovery, like it is brave because it is like, it's a kind of public way to go about it. But also like you are a creative. That is the thing that you have been doing. And you're also accomplishing like making people laugh, trying to make feel people feel better and happy. That's like a lot of birds with one stone <laughs> yeah it's it's that's I'm, I'm very excited about this i did watch your vlog and i watched your like among us stuff and like i was like oh that's that's definitely jenny i love it <laughs> Every, <laughs> like it's so jenny <laughs> everything that i make going forward it's just gonna be like it's gonna have my own little personal flavor of dumbassery in it and I mean, that's the best flavor you can offer, <laughs> to be honest. Um, you did mention like the not so nice comments on TikTok. And I guess, <laughs> yeah, they were <laughs> mean guess... to me. <laughs> it hurt my feelings very badly. <laughs> mm -hmm. There were a couple days last year when my videos were at like the peak of, thy, of their virality where I just kind of had to like pull myself up in my apartment and just like put a blanket over my head and kind of like ignore the rest of the world. But I think the thing that I ultimately landed on going viral and also like talking about it in therapy and talking about it with my friends is that like I'm still like I don't regret uploading those videos at all. Like people were going to be mean to me but they're always I don't know I'm a woman on the internet people are always going to be mean to me. <laughs> and true. so but the thing that I keep coming back to is the comments where people say like these videos made my day or like oh my gosh please keep making these like these made me laugh really hard and like those are the comments that I really care more about like 
those other comments aren't going to stop hurting at any point. I think that when it comes to handling comments, um, that's a great way to go about it because it's always the negative comments. And like, I, I hear this from a lot of YouTubers. It's the negative comments. Like they always feel like they weigh a hundred times oh, more, yeah. even if the quantity is disproportionate. Like even mm -hmm. if it's just a handful compared to thousands of positive ones. And like, exactly. it always hurts so much being able to remember that, no, they don't actually matter all that much. That's kind of what I've been checking in with myself where it's like, hey, what do you remember more from those TikTok videos that you uploaded? Like, do you remember all those? Like, do you remember specific ones calling you out? And I'm like, no, I remember like the general things that they would say to me that hurt my feelings. I'm like, but do you remember like specific like comments that made you happy? And I'm like, oh, yeah, no, for sure I do. And so I'm like, oh, cool. And that's more important. <laughs> I, I just really hope you have fun with it. Like, it's one of the best places to have fun. Are there future things or future projects that perhaps you could share watch all night arcade uh at ame kicks on tiktok it's a real labor of love from pretty much everyone involved and it's really cool i'm excited about it so watch that and also please subscribe to my youtube channel because it's gonna be really stupid <laughs> <laughs> i will leave the link to the new series and her youtube channel in the description do you have advice for those trying to get into the entertainment industry be a nice person don't be a douchebag because so many people, they come into this, they come into this field and they think that like a big ego making people feel small is going to be what gets them far. But those people, we just, we sniff them out pretty early and we don't talk to them because why the hell would you want to work with someone like that, let alone like be friends with them? The voiceover industry in particular is extremely small and we keep our circles very tight. And so if you come into the voiceover industry and you're a jerk, it's not just going to be like, we don't just think of you as someone that we're going to have to work with. We think of some you as someone that we're going to see at parties or bars or like hangouts, like birthday parties. And if we don't want you there, like, then you're not going to work. Cause like, why would we want to work with you? Why would we want to be around you? So be a per good person and like, don't be a phony good person. Don't just be nice to someone to get something that you want. Like actually give a shit about them. Like ask them about their vacation, ask them about their kids. Like remember their names, remember their birthday and not just voice actors, like the engineers and people like that. Like, it's important. That is, like, real, actually amazing advice because I can't imagine the number of people who, like, try to go in thinking it's easy. I guess that's pretty much it for this episode. Thank you so much, Jenny. You're <laughs> such a wonderful person, and I'm so glad that you accepted this invitation. Like, hey. whether you were working on a project, whether it's a YouTube video or, and like... Me and, Ra <laughs> me and Rainbow Slug are both very happy <laughs> to be here. Thank you, Rainbow Slug. <laughs> Next week, I will be joined by Aster from Chill with Aster, and we're going to talk about her content creation journey as a college student and chat about being a Filipino content creator in the YouTube Genshin space. If you are listening to this on YouTube, just know that this uh, podcast is also available on Spotify. If you're listening on Spotify, you can check it out on YouTube and leave a comment there. And we will see you soon. Thank you, Jenny and listener. Take care. Bye. Also, since this might be an audio medium, Rainbow Slug is a fidget toy that I have. I'm not just a crazy person. No, it's a, it's an actual Rainbow Slug. It's an actual Rainbow Slug. <laughs> okay, bye, internet. <laughs> bye, internet. <laughs>